Excellent. So, welcome to this lecture about methods and applications. Um, we should have, also because I do like 20 slides a minute, we should have quite some time. So if you have questions um, that are semi-urgent or something is not clear, feel free to raise your hand and then do raise your hand. Um, and then we can cover them during the lecture. Um, and otherwise, of course, there will be time for questions afterwards. And there will be a break roughly in the middle. Oh, and the slides will be here. Gil will also share them using whatever is used nowadays by Maastricht University to share these things. I used to do my PhD here, and then I did a postdoc, and then in 2011 I switched to the Open University, which is the second Limburgian university here in this region. It's in Heerle, which is a city slightly east from here, but it's a distance teaching university. So it's mostly with older students um, that have a job or they, the children left home and they decide they want to go study. So that's where I teach, uh, teach now. Um, if I understand everything correctly, you've basically had step two now, or you're working on step two, which means you're creating matrices like these with lots of change objectives to target your target population, target um, behavior in some population, and potentially also already for the environmental agents, which is basically just repeating the exercises. So that's step two, and eventually we do all this because we want to move to step four, which is developing some intervention. This is a Dutch peer education intervention in nightlife settings. Basically, it's people who uh, use drugs who inform other people who use drugs how to do that safely. So, for example, explaining why it's important to get your ecstasy tested, explaining why you shouldn't combine cocaine and alcohol because it's more damaging and stuff like that. Um, so that's, those are the kinds of interventions we want to develop to basically make the world a better place in step four. And then in between we have step three, which basically covers what's under the hood in an intervention, why the intervention works. Um, and in this first part of the lecture, I kind of do a bit of a rehash of everything in step two, because it's useful if everybody's on the same page before we move into this, uh, the change processes. So we want to create interventions, like the ones on the left. These are all nightlife interventions, so they're about ecstasy or hearing protection or consent and sex and stuff like that. We create these because we want to um, increase people's quality of life or prevent decreases in quality of life, or we want to uh, prevent health-related risks or increase people's health. And unfortunately, these interventions can't directly target those outcomes that we actually want. Because in the middle, there are pesky humans. So what we do is we have to make sure that these humans behave the right way in the right, at the right moment. And this behavior is basically always muscle activity. Speaking is muscle activity. Um, moving is muscle activity. That's maybe a bit more obvious. Um, and as I guess most of you will know, muscle activity is controlled by our, by our central nervous system, which in turn is controlled from our brain. So eventually, we'll need to change stuff in people's brain if you want to make the world a better place. Or if you're less ideal idealistically inclined, if you want to earn money. So the question is, to make sure that the motor cortex sends the right signals at the right time, what do we have to change in people's brains? And if you think about this, um, most of you will be familiar with models like this, where you have a drawing of a Oh, that's next later. I'm running ahead of myself. Um, these neurons, these brain cells, you have about uh, 90 billion of those. That's quite a lot, so just to, to give some uh, frame of reference, we have about uh, 200 billion stars in our galaxy. So that's just our galaxy, that's not the complete universe, in case you thought, oh, that seems less than last time I counted. That's just because it's only our galaxy. Um, and there are about 8 billion people on the planet, which is like really a lot. Like I, I personally know maybe a third of that, if that. So basically, having 90 billion neurons is really a lot of neurons. And it gets worse, because these pictures you see in textbooks, they usually slow, they usually look a bit like the ones you see in the background here. You have one of those uh, neurons, and it's connected to a few other ones, um, and then neurotransmitters are released, and that's how your brain communicates. And biological psychology is not my strong suit, so when I created the first version of these slides, I looked up how many connections there are on average, and it's like 7,000, apparently, on average. Which is way more than the impression I had, at least, based on those textbooks. 
So this is quite hard to intervene on, because even if you could get a scalpel and cut inside people's brains, which we tried, but the ethical committee objected, so we had to find other ways. Even if you could do that, it's not a very feasible route. Because imagine that you can do one billion of neurons an hour, then you would have to spend at least a few days for every individual to find the right neuron to cut. Um, so, in the second part, we'll mostly look at how you can actually achieve change, despite the fact that we can't actually um, work through the from the neuron level upward. So eventually, as I said, we want to increase people's quality of life, or we want to prevent decreases in people's quality of life. And generally, we use health as the main predictor of quality of life, mostly because if people have lower health, that's, that quickly becomes very expensive. And usually our funders will be government related, and the government has a clear interest in decreasing their costs. So generally, if we develop uh, interventions, we will use health as a kind of uh, hook until at some point society is civilized enough to also actually care about whether people are happy. And then we can move more towards that direction. <coughs> and people's health is predicted mostly by their behavior, but also by their environment, environmental conditions. So that means if we want to increase people's quality of life and or health, you always work through people's environment or their behavior, which together pretty much sums up everything on this planet, of course. We know that behavior is predicted by what we call personal determinants, which is basically the name for psychological constructs that predict behavior in this field of behavior change science. So that means we'll need to change those personal determinants. People are in an environment, and in this environment you have, well, the personal level, that's actually not the environment, that's actually the person, but around that person you tend to have other persons, so then you get people's interpersonal environment. We are now basically each other's interpersonal environment, which means that we can influence each other's behavior. And around this you have often organizations. For example, the Maastricht University can change policies, can change things, and thereby directly influence everybody's behavior. They might close the canteen, for example. Or they may decide to no longer offer high caloric options as food. Um, around that you often have communities. That differs a bit per country, but in some countries you have quite strong communities that you can also use to influence people's environments and behaviors. For example, here in this region, in Limburg, you have quite a strong carnival tradition. This is a master course, right? So not everybody may have experienced that yet, but you will experience it begin next year. So if you live in the city center and you don't like a lot of partying people for a week, then you might want to find out when carnival is and make sure you're not here during that period. Um, but around this carnival community, it's, it's in this culture, you have well communities, you have associations, and be people prepare a lot. They well, they celebrate carnival quite intensely, they dress up, etc. Those kinds of community organizations can also be used and also form people's environment if you want to shift norms, for example. Around this you have societies, usually nations, and around that you have the, the global level. For example, during the um, pandemic, uh, you saw that the WHO made suggestions and tried to get countries to implement certain rules. So if you think about a person, and their environment, you can think of these spheres of environments that get larger and larger. And for each of those, you can use different means to try to change something on that level. For example, the highest levels, society and supranational, that becomes quite political. So that means if you want to change something there, you have to make sure that whichever politician should make a decision thinks that the people who might vote for them want them to do something. If you work on the organizational level, you have to convince the the, uh, the president of Maastricht University, that maybe they should stop serving high caloric food options in the canteen. But if you do convince them, then you're basically done, then it's just solved, because they just tell people in the organization to change things and then it's done. You don't have such means if you work on the interpersonal level. I mean, okay, some group of friends have managers, but generally most interpersonal groups don't actually have managers or hierarchies. So that means you have to use different processes. So each of these environmental levels give you new methods to try to change things on that level, depending on the characteristics of the level. 
So these are important if you want to change people's uh, environment. But generally, we work through um, personal determinants that predict uh, behaviors. If you talk about behavior, we often use umbrella terms, like people should have safe sex. People should um, minimize their drug use risks. People should uh, exercise. But for any of those behaviors, if you look at what people actually have to do, they consist of much more specific, much more precise behaviors. So if you want to um, minimize your drug taking risks, then you should get your ecstasy or cocaine or GHB or ketamine. You should get it tested to make sure. That, so I was last weekend, I was at a conference in Berlin, a nightlife themed conference, Stad nach Acht. If you like nightlife stuff, it's great. It's very multidisciplinary. And one of the groups of people that attends that conference every year are the drug testing people. We have lots of drug testing agencies in Europe. And they, of course, keep track of the dosage of drugs and how clean they are, how much adulterants there are in the different drugs. And there I found out that apparently cocaine is on average 66% pure right now in Spain, that was, I think, which is probably kind of... Ecstasy is still, MDMA is still really pure. So because of these reasons, it's really important that people get their drugs tested. If you want to get your drugs tested, you have to find out where to go, if it's the first time you do it. Then you have to go there, you have to leave your drugs, you have to keep the codes that you usually get to check your results. Then you have to check your results. And then ideally, from a harm reduction perspective, if, for example, you have MDMA, like ecstasy pills, that's the same thing, um, and it's, it contains something that you don't expect, like an hallucinogenic drug that you probably won't, won't want to use, definitely not without knowing that you use it, people throw away the drugs that they have. Which, of course, may have very different determinants, very different reasons why people do or don't do that, than why they go to the testing service. When you think about going to the testing services, the determinants might be more like stigma-related. Because drug use is still stigmatized a lot in these countries, like drugs are bad and stuff like that. So people might not want others to see them entering the drug testing service, because they know that drug use is stigmatized, so they might be thought of less by others. But that, of course, doesn't play a role when it's about throwing away drugs. That's more about optimizing your experience. It might have to do with how much money people have to spend and how much the drugs cost, et cetera, et cetera. So these different performance objectives have different causes, generally. And that's also the principle you use to decide whether to distinguish performance objectives. Because, of course, in theory, if you think about getting your drugs tested, for example, you could distinguish every step people take to walk to the testing center, because these are different behaviors. But of course, the determinants and environmental conditions are the same for every step. So you wouldn't need to distinguish them. So that's how you decide where to cut a behavior up into performance objectives. When the environmental conditions and the determinants are the same, you can lump everything together and you can distinguish at that level of specificity. But as soon as other factors start playing a role with the behavior, you have to distinguish them. Because otherwise, you run the risk of missing some of those factors while you create your matrices of change objectives, for example. Okay, these environmental conditions, fortunately, are controlled by environmental actors. And environmental actors, for now, until we reach the singularity and artificial intelligence will take over the world, for now, these environmental actors are just humans. So that means that basically how people's environments look is a consequence of the behavior of other people. And those behaviors, again, consist of performance objectives, which again are predicted by environmental conditions and personal determinants. So it's basically the same, uh, same process. And then, of course, those environmental conditions of those people, of politicians or managers, are again uh, determined by other um, environmental actors, etc. So in the end, it's all about personal determinants. When we can change personal determinants, we can change everything. So it boils down to, it comes back to the brain, and specifically the motor cortex. Now the motor cortex has the benefit that it's basically located there. We know where it is, we know how it connects to your, um, the neurons that control your muscles. But determinants of behavior don't have that. It's not like your attitude regarding buying condoms is somewhere in your head. So we need another way to think about this. And fortunately, psychological research and theory gives us some, um, yeah, some footholds, some handholds for this. This, as you know, is a neuron. And these neurons are connected to other neurons 
and they can fire, and when they fire, they can um, exhibit or inhibit each other. And this pattern of spending activation is a useful way to start thinking about how we can think about the bits of people's psyche that cause, predict their behavior. There's a nice test for this that you may be familiar with already, but maybe not. So just in case, we are going to do it anyway. So you'll now see a series of words appear, and you just have to remember them. And when they're done, you'll see a second series, a second list, and you only have to indicate for every word in the second list whether it was in this first list that you'll see appearing. Everybody ready? Okay, let's go. Okay. Was cloud in the list? Excellent. Hospital? Office? Table? Dentist? Lawyer? Sick? Carpenter? Clock doctor? <laughs> Aha. This always works and here even most of you or some of you knew it already probably. So well, if you know it, this will be familiar. The key here is that all these concepts were very related. And because this concept of spreading activation, it's not only how your, your brain cells communicate, but it also works conceptually at a higher level. So these words, hospital, stethoscope, dentist, treatment, lawyer, and sick, are all super related to the concept of doctor. And the theory here is that because you hear all those concepts, the concept of doctor also receives a lot of activation. And if I ask you whether something was in the list, you can't turn back time or rewind the recording of what happened in your mind. So the, the metacognitive skill that you actually use to answer that question, whether something was in the list, consists of um, assessing the activation level of that concept. And the idea is, if that concept was sufficiently activated, then it must have been in the list, because then it occurred. And this trick uses that. So this idea of spending activation is kind of useful if you think about determinants of behavior. So for any given behavior, you can think that you can consider that a human has a number of dimensions that they attribute to the behavior. For example, a behavior might be more or less interesting. They might think it's more or less easy. They might feel guilt or shame re regarding, to behave, regarding the behavior. They might think it's good for them or not. They might have ideas about what their partner does. So all these things are representations on a very tiny level that people have of the world. And of course you can have, well, an infinite amount of those, because you can choose those nodes, those little circles yourself. But what we do in psychology is that we basically bundle a bunch of those and we say, we call it like this. And that's then a construct. Intention to do a behavior basically contains some of these concepts. And then we say, okay, we call all these things intention. And then we call these things people's attitude, and we call these things people's personal norm, and these we call people's beha perceived behavioral control. And the idea is that those things that we cluster together, they are either very similar, or they are functionally very similar. So they have to say, play the same role in people's psyche. And, well, that's very useful, but it can also be a bit confusing, because sometimes you can get a bit of people's psyche that's actually in multiple constructs at the same time. So whether people consider a behavior pleasant is part of attitude, specifically experiential attitude, those parts of attitude that have to do with experiences, or rather expected experiences, but also intrinsic regulation, which is a contract, construct from a different theory, from self-determination theory. And that makes sense, of course. There's a kind of a joke about that for psychologists, theories are like toothbrushes. No self-respecting psychologist would use somebody else's. That's a bit of a cynical take, but not entirely untrue. Um, but there are, we have a lot of theories, and they basically, when they explain behavior, of course, deal with the same bits of people's psyche. Because they try to explain the same stuff. And they will cut those up differently in constructs, but you will find a lot of similarities in what they actually measure if you look at the items or the definitions, for example. 
And that can be a bit confusing if you're working on step two and on the determinants. Because of course then, which theories do you choose? And intervention mapping fortunately kind of solves that, that by not really caring about theory. Or actually at the same time, that's actually interesting. So it doesn't really care about specific theories, but it just cares about the use of theory. Intervention mapping just says, for any problem, use whichever theory seems most relevant given your target behavior and target population. And then you end up with theories around habit or theories around recent action or theories around norms. And the idea is that you can combine as many of those as you want. And because of that, it's not a problem that these theories partly measure the same things. Then you just know that you don't need some theories because they cover the same ground that you already covered. Okay, so what we do is we take these constructs, we draw some arrows, and then we say, ta-da, this is our theory of behavior. But you can consider those simultaneously kind of from the same perspective. You have all those tiny representations people have in their mind, or associations, if you look at automatic behavior. Those consist of Q-response associations, which you can kind of represent the same way. And then our theory is just define a bunch of those together as a construct and then explain how those constructs are related. So, we want to look at people's brain and how to change those and for this exercise we use psychological constructs. So those are the determinants that cause the behavior. And those consist, at a lower level, of what you could call subdeterminants or beliefs or what you call change objectives in intervention mapping. And those are very, very specific. So determinants are defined at a generic level, like psychological constructs, because you can study them for different behaviors, different people, and the idea is that attitude is relevant around the world for lots of behaviors. And because of that, it's super generically defined. But of course, that also means that it's so generically defined that it's practically useless if you want to think about what to target in an intervention. You generally don't have an intervention that has messages like, have a high attitude, have a high intention. You need to convince people using specific arguments that relate to the specific behavior. So where those determinants are super generically defined, if you want to develop an intervention, you actually need the stuff inside those determinants, inside the constructs, which are the change objectives. For example, the advantages or disadvantages of a behavior, or the perceived behavior of certain other social reference which together form the norms. So you have the theories and the determinants constructs at a generic at the top level, and then very specifically you have the change objectives. And the change objectives are what you target with the intervention. You just need the determinants for reasons that will become clear later on. And in between, of course, you have other levels that you can distinguish. It's not like there is a level for determinants and a level for subdeterminants. The point is that subdeterminants need to be so specific you can target them. But even then, you can always make stuff more specific or a bit more generic. So you could say that people have an intention or motivation or whatever to drink coffee at lunch, but you can make that a bit more specific. And you can say, well, part of that intention is their attitude towards drinking coffee at lunch. And then you can be more specific and you can say, well, you also have the experiential attitude relating to experiences. And then you can make it even more specific and you can say, there's people might believe that if you drink coffee uh, during lunch, you feel more energetic. And then you can make it even more specific by saying that people might believe that if they drink coffee in Maastricht during lunch, they feel more energetic. And then you can go on and on and on. So this is kind of like a dimension of specificity, you could say. We know that people have a psyche, that's what we study with psychology, and we know that if we want to change their behavior, or rather, if we want to change their health or quality of life, we need to change their behavior. And if we want to change their behavior, we need to change parts of the psyche. And psychology has a lot of instruments for that, namely our theories and constructs. And those constructs can be considered more or less specific or generic. And it's important to be aware of this and the fact that you decide how specifically you define something. Because for interventions, ultimately, you can only target sufficiently specific stuff. You can't communicate in very vague terms. But we also need to know which constructs, which determinants, those specific things belong to, to be able to change them. And we'll get back to that later. So those subdeterminants are like the tiny little representations people have. And those are what you may have been working on 
or maybe not, in a spreadsheet that helps you make a long list of subdeterminants and then you move towards a shorter list where you select which ones you want to target. Okay, so these personal determinants consist of subdeterminants or change objectives. Those are the things we target. Um, and then once you have a long list of those, ideally you do empirical research. And I think you already had a lecture by Rick, I think, about step two, where he introduced um, this plot where you basically visualize how people represent the world. So here we know that um, about half the people believe that if you use a higher dose of ecstasy, so a dose with more MDMA in it, because the dose of MDMA in ecstasy pills was increasing like about uh, six to eight years ago. So in the Netherlands we did a study to find out why people would use a higher dose of MDMA rather than a lower dose, because everybody thought that the youth nowadays doesn't use ecstasy anymore as people used in the old days, where they want the loving feeling. No, they just want to be as intoxicated as possible, or to go as hard as possible, as we say in the Netherlands. So there was this fear, so we did a study to find out how people consider highly dosed ecstasy pills with regularly dosed ecstasy pills. So here you see that about half the people think that if you use a higher dose, making contact with others is easier, and about half the people think it's harder. And means most people do realize that if you use a higher dose, you will remember less which is good, because that's true. And people realize that time seems to pass faster, which of course is connected with the effects on memory. Um, and most people already know that a higher dose is worse for your health. Some people think it's better for your health, because then, as they say, apparently there's less room for adulterants in the pill, because there's so much MDMA in it. Um, but most people know that it's actually worse for the health. And then you combine this with the correlations, and then you can select which subdeterminants or determinants you want to target in your intervention. So for example, the first one, the fact that most people think, or most people, some, there are enough people who think that it's easier to make contact with others when you use a higher dose, that there is room for improvement. We can explain to them that actually it is not easier, because it isn't actually easier if you look at how effective, uh, what the effects are. So we can target this determinant. But health doesn't seem sensible, because most people already believe that it's bad for you, worse for you than regularly dosed ecstasy pills. So there's not really any room for improvement here, even though the correlation is positive. I mean, we could target it, but there are only a few people we could influence. So the effect size of the intervention would be relatively low. So you wouldn't be able to find an effect unless you have a huge sample, etc. Okay, so you use this to select, and then you can start constructing what we call the causal structural chain of effects of your intervention. And it's called causal structural, because it combines structural assumptions with causal assumptions. Here you see two structural assumptions. As, we so, as I showed earlier, these sub-behaviors or performance objectives together form your target behavior. And because they form it, it's a structural assumption. It explains how you think the world looks, basically. And then you have a causal assumption that actually this sub-behavior is caused by a determinant. And this determinant consists of sub-determinants. So here you see two structural assumptions, which subdeterminants are important and which determinants they belong to, and which sub-behaviors are important and which behaviors they, they uh, belong to. And you see a causal assumption, namely that whichever determinant you have here influences the sub-behavior. And then we have three more links that we will um, fill with actually the behavior change stuff, now that we did the recap of what to target. So. I think we are almost at the break, but before the break, I have a brief, two brief videos. You saw these cyber plots earlier. Um, Rick and me developed it to try to make it easier for people to do these determinant selection um, exercises. And I did a few determinant studies in Dutch nightlife settings. And our idea was that we would um, use these cyber plots to represent the results after we know why people want to use a higher dose or why they want to ask for consent when they are flirting or other nightlife-related risk behaviors. And then we give those cyber plots to the prevention organizations, and then they have what they need to develop evidence-based interventions. And it turned out that the cyber plots were way too complicated for people at prevention organizations, because they generally, they're not academically trained always, they don't per se like statistics, I wouldn't know why, but not everybody likes statistics. Um, so we thought about how to actually get this information with them, and then we created two um, brief movies. I included them here for three reasons. First, 
apparently it's good to include movies in lectures because then you get high evaluations and that's of course what we all live for. Second, um, it kind of summarizes the whole idea briefly, so it can be a nice change. But third, it also shows the kind of problems you may run into in real life if you work on behavior change stuff. It kind of shows how much you have to simplify things to communicate with normal people about this kind of stuff who weren't trained in behavior change. So that's actually a real tension that you may run into. How do you develop effective interventions to change risk behavior among party goers? First, you have to know why they behave like this. Unfortunately, simply asking, hey, why do you do this, is not enough. Our behavior is affected by a combination of environmental factors and personal beliefs about this behavior. Mostly, we're not aware of these. In order to find out which beliefs determine risk behavior of party goers, we set up Party Panel. We work according to different theories on behavioral change. One of these is the reasoned action approach. It holds that these beliefs can be divided into three categories. Attitude. This is about the expected consequences of this behavior and how you evaluate those. Perceived norms. This is about whether you think others approve and what you think others do themselves. And perceived behavioral control. This is about whether you think you can successfully perform this behavior. All beliefs we study come from experts and a group of party goers and are measured in questionnaires that are filled out by participants online. The answers to the questionnaires provide an insight into which beliefs the participants hold and which beliefs most strongly affect their behavior. As an example, let's take the behavior brushing your teeth. Let's say you want to make people who don't brush their teeth enough brush more often by means of an intervention. First, you need to understand why they don't brush their teeth often enough. You want to know which beliefs people have about the consequences of not brushing their teeth often enough and how important they are. For example, the premise. If I don't brush my teeth often enough, it's more likely that I'll get cavities and I definitely don't like cavities. Or, if I do brush my teeth often enough, this will surely freshen my breath and I like that. But you also want to know what people assume about opinions and behavior of others and how important this is to them. For example, my girlfriend likes it if I brush my teeth twice a day and her opinion matters to me. And you also want to know how easy or just how difficult it is to brush your teeth often enough. I don't brush my teeth more often because I often forget. This shows low perceived behavioral control. I always have enough toothpaste and an extra toothbrush at home shows a lot of perceived behavioral control. So, it's possible that people expect that brushing their teeth often enough reduces the risk of cavities, but that it doesn't affect their behavior. At the same time, it is possible that a partner's opinion does strongly predict whether they brush often enough. So, an ad featuring a happy girlfriend will have a stronger impact than one featuring a dentist giving advice. Once you know which beliefs most strongly predict the behavior you wish to change, you can start figuring out which methods are most likely to be effective. For more info about the behaviors we have studied using Party Panel and for tips about the development of likely... So the idea was that this would give people at prevention organizations some background as to, yeah, basically, step two. And then we made very brief... Interventions. Um, very brief videos explaining the results. So you have to imagine that these are... Normally we have like a cyber plot and we had like 30 or 35 sub... Uh, determinants that we measured here. Lots of expectations about using a high dose of ecstasy. This is what was left over after the people we worked with who created a video, who are much better at communicating with normal people about things, explained how much we had to simplify and therefore how much content we had to cut out since we wanted short movies because they're expensive and because the hope was that people would share, share them with each other. So this is what you end up with sometimes if you work with practical organizations in this behavior change space. In 2015, we conducted a survey among 868 participants who go out and use ecstasy from time to time. We asked them about different beliefs related to three specific behaviors. Buying highly dosed ecstasy pills, using a high dose of MDMA, and having ecstasy pills tested. In this video, we highlight using a high dose of MDMA. 
This party panel showed that the intention of using a high dose of MDMA is related to the belief that this will affect the positive effects like intoxication, experiencing a longer and more intense high, and connecting more easily with others. That you can say no when someone offers you MDMA while already intoxicated. That this affects your hangover the following days. And that you'll be sorry the next day. It's remarkable that participants understand that higher doses of MDMA involve greater health risks, but that this understanding doesn't really affect their behavior. During an intervention, you can explain that a higher dose of MDMA increases the chances of unwanted effects. Higher doses increase social isolation, make it feel like time passes more quickly, and can cause hallucinations. Also, the effects people want, such as feeling euphoric, connecting with others, and socializing more easily, decrease. Click here for more info about Party Panel or visit the website. Okay, so that gives you some idea. So, what you learn here in the intervention method. In 2015. It wasn't that fun. Um, so, in intervention mapping, you get all this sophisticated theoretical and, well, kind of practical tools to think about behavior change and to map out the world, at least the bits that are important if you want to achieve some quality of life or health goals. Um, but this framework that you develop, a lot of people at practical organizations, policymakers, managers, politicians don't have that yet. So even though all this is true, you have to realize at the same time in your communication with others, you might not be able to use the entire framework because they just have, they lack the, the representation of a lot of those important bits. Okay, ah, excellent. So now it's break time and it's 10 past Two, so let's say, I guess you normally have 15 minutes breaks, 10, 15 minutes. We're quite good on time. So if there are no questions now, that means that we can just start the break. And then I would say we start again at half past uh, two. Yes, excellent. See you then.